as she was finishing, as she was graduating as one of the world's leading experts in the desert and what the desert has taught the Christian tradition, she turned down the offer from Oxford University Press to write the book on this for her generation and opted instead to go to Palestine to go and live in the desert, something like uh, what got into Jesus uh, got into her. The spirit drove her out into the wilderness and she lived in a tent out there in the desert and uh, walked about the desert trying to understand the place that had given her so much riches, so much wisdom through the tradition. She stayed there a few years, but told me one time that after she had been there praying for a while, she heard the voice of the Lord come to her very clearly and say, dear sister, this was the desert for those who came before you, but this is not your desert. You need to go home. Go home to the inner city of America and learn to face the demons in your own desert. She moved to North Philadelphia, which at the time was a uh, terribly blighted place, abandoned after the factories had been closed, uh, a place where whole blocks of houses were boarded up and where those who were left to live in poverty and desolation were often overwhelmed by addiction. She got to know from a Pentecostal preacher a recovery program that some folks there were involved in and decided to start what the uh, desert tradition had started in the desert, uh, a community called a Laurel, uh, called New Jerusalem. And the New Jerusalem Laurel was planted there in North Philadelphia uh, with Sister Margaret and a couple other sisters from her order and about 50 recovering addicts at any given time who Sister Margaret has considered since the very beginning to be her teachers. I love to go and do Bible study with them when I'm in Philadelphia, to sit there in the circle and to listen to the insights of these folks who have lived in America's wilderness, some of them for all of their lives. And I never forget when I'm, when I'm thinking of that place and of that story, the sign which they've hung there in their living room, there where they gather for Bible study every morning, the sign that says, my recovery will never be complete until I help to heal the society that made me sick. The society that we live in, the world that we live in is broken, is sick, and you don't need a guest preacher to tell you that. I'm sure you know here in your place the, the signs that point to the division. If you, if you don't know them firsthand from experience, you simply have to turn on the news to see that we have brokenness that erupts in violence, that erupts in inequality, that erupts over and over again in people doing to one another some of the worst things that, that we can possibly imagine. You don't need me to tell you that the world is broken. And yet on this first Sunday of Lent, the gospel invites us into the desert to follow Jesus into the wilderness, perhaps to learn something about how we might face the demons in the way of Jesus. The terrible thing about the desert uh, in history and today is that there are no good maps for the desert. Uh, as you begin your Lenten journey, I'm sorry to tell you that there's no road map I can lay out for you uh, about what you will confront what you will see when you struggle honestly with those demons. There is, of course, a great tradition, that one that Sister Margaret and others have studied, a great tradition that can teach us stories and lessons from the past. But there is no roadmap. Mark gives us no roadmap. The, the story we have is, is fairly scant, especially in Mark's gospel. Instead of a roadmap, what we get, I think, is a guiding principle a guiding principle that we would do well to learn from. A guiding principle that says to us, if you're going into the desert, the most important thing to know is that you are God's beloved. <laughs>
with whom God is well pleased. It is immediately, Mark says, what God speaks about Jesus before the Spirit drives him into the wilderness. You are my beloved. With you I am well pleased. And in the history of the church's struggle with the demons that we've faced over and over again in the human story, there is no single point that is more important to remember than the fact that we are loved. This is Black History Month, and beginning Lent in Black History Month makes a pale-skinned fellow like me, among uh, so many pale-skinned people like most of you, uh, think of uh, the role that white folks have played in the black-led freedom struggle of this country over the generations. I think it can be instructive to us in terms of the temptations that we face when we look the demons head on. Of course, Martin Luther King taught us that America's original sin is the sin of racism. So many of the sins and the temptations that we face are rooted in that original sin of this country that, that made for a race-based system that forced some people to do the work that others didn't want to do, that built a whole economy, that built generations of wealth on the backs of people that were stolen from their own home and forced to do other people's work. That, that demon of racism has been resisted all along by people who've lived in the wilderness, who've lived in the face of it. And I'm struck by the way that white folks have engaged that struggle through the generations. It's, a, it's, it's an instructive lesson for us of what can happen if we forget that we face the demons because we are loved. I think one of the temptations is to, in struggling against the demons, to be overcome by anger. If we look back uh, to 1860 and to John Brown in his struggle, John Brown who had joined in solidarity with the abolition movement, who so passionately wanted to see an end of slavery, John Brown was overwhelmed by his anger, was unwilling to submit to the leadership of people who had become friends like Frederick Douglass and wanted to, wanted to force the solution, wanted to uh, bring an end to this terrible institution of slavery. And so he led that uh, revolt. He led that attack on Harper's Ferry and in so many ways precipitated that civil war that would bring our country uh, to so much heartache. There is a danger when we face our demons that we would become overwhelmed by anger and forget that we are primarily driven by love. A hundred years later, I think we see another example uh, down in Alabama in, uh, in the life of George Wallace. It's, it's, it's often easy for those of us who've seen the newsreels of Wallace as the governor to forget that he began in Alabama as a populist. He began as a churchman, a good Methodist who wanted to help the poor man in Alabama, who wanted to uplift people who had been living in poverty for so long, both black and white. George Wallace was a populist until he got beat by John Patterson and swore that he would never be out end again, as he said. He ran on a segregationist platform and became the governor who stood in the doorway of the university saying, segregation today, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. Wallace is a good example, a good reminder to us of what the uh, rock star Bono said in that song about how you can become a monster fighting the monster so that the monster will not overtake you. If our struggle against the demons, if our struggle against the worst that's in us and in our society is driven by fear, we can so easily slip into cynical realism that transforms us into representatives, into uh, people who are working out the power of the same forces, the same spirit that we start out to resist. And yet in that history, there are also great examples for us of those who have remembered that primarily 
we are called to face the demons because we know that we are loved. We remember in just a couple of weeks the 50th anniversary of that march from Selma to Montgomery, that march that began on Bloody Sunday, when a small group of local people who had been working for voting rights in Selma, Alabama, were going to walk across the Edmund Pettus Bridge. They were met by local officials and by state troopers under the leadership of Lieutenant Al Lingo, and they were brutally beaten, gassed, and driven back into Selma. Dr. Martin Luther King put out a call to all people of goodwill in the country, black, white, Jewish, Christian, anyone who would come, come and support the movement in Selma. There was a young woman in the suburbs of Detroit, Michigan, who drove her family car to Alabama and showed up and offered her support. Viola Liuzzo was her name. She brought her car with her and used it to shuttle folks along the march route back and forth as they traveled over that week between Selma and Montgomery. And it was on that highway, on that highway where a member of the Ku Klux Klan shot and killed her, where she poured out herself in love. Poured out herself knowing that she had been invited to join a movement that was for what was right, that was for what would win eventually. And so in a few weeks, when, when folks are there to reenact that march from Selma to Montgomery, as they walk along that highway, there are no markers on that highway to commemorate George Wallace and his regime in Alabama. There are no markers to remember those violent Klansmen who wanted to defend their version of the South and of Alabama. But they will remember Viola Liuzzo and others like her who primarily driven by love, knowing that they were loved and that love is the most powerful force in the universe, were able to give themselves to a future that some people said wasn't possible, but that they knew was possible with God because God can make a way out of no way. God can lead you into the desert where you will face the wild beasts and yet God can send angels to attend you. God can feed you with bread from ravens' mouths. God can cause springs to bubble up in the desert. God can sustain us if we're willing to trust this way of Jesus that is primarily rooted in knowing that we can face the demons because we are loved. I was visiting with Sister Margaret several years ago there at the community that she started in North Philadelphia, a community that's been going for over 30 years now. We were sitting outside of her house there in this urban desert where she and her friends decided to plant a garden, a garden that now covers a whole city block, a garden that has vegetables and produce that they eat, a, 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 a wood-fired oven in the corner where they bake bread and quite a few flowers that they've planted just to make the place a little more beautiful. A few years ago, the Philadelphia Inquirer actually gave their garden the award for Philadelphia, the Garden of the Year Award. It was the best garden in town. And as we were sitting there in that prize-winning garden, I remember Sister Margaret saying, you know, when I was in Palestine, when I was living out there in the desert, I would uh, get up early every morning to take a walk. Because in the morning in the desert, right when the sun is rising, there are these little flowers that, that, that close up at night, but, but at, the first, at the first light of the morning, they open up. She said to me, there's, there's nothing more beautiful than a flower blooming in the desert. There's something about the desert that makes the flower more beautiful. I think that's what Mark is getting at in today's gospel lesson. Indeed, I think that is the word of the Lord for us. You, God's beloved children in whom God is well pleased, there's nothing more beautiful there's nothing more beautiful 
than a flower blooming in the desert. Indeed, go into the desert with confidence because the desert itself somehow makes the flower more beautiful. Amen.